A new analysis suggests that many black Americans believe the racial bias in U.S. institutions is not merely a matter of passive negligence. It is the result of intentional design. Specifically, large majorities describe the systems in the U.S., such as prison, 74%, political, 67%, and economic, 65%, among others, as having been designed to hold black people back, either a great deal or a fair amount. Black Americans' distrust of U.S. institutions is informed by history, from slavery to the implementation of Jim Crow laws in the South, to the rise of mass incarceration, and more. However, black Americans were never really alone in this solemn exposition. Let me say that again. The whole history of America is the history of rich white men telling not rich white people that their enemies are black and brown. It starts in the colonies of what would become the United States. Let's remember, during the colonial period, mid-1600s, there was no such thing as white people. I know some people who are now called white find that shocking, right? Because they think whiteness is real, right? But whiteness was created. Europeans didn't call themselves white. We didn't call ourselves white. We weren't all members of one big happy family. Are you kidding? Have you studied the history of Europe? The history of Europe was about killing each other. That's what we did in Europe. We just killed each other before we figured out there were other people to kill. We just killed each other, right? I mean, that was the history of Europe. The English hated the Irish, right? Northern Italians didn't even think that Southern Italians were Italians. The Germans hated everybody and everybody hated their ass right back, right? There was no team called white, no race called white, but all of a sudden, in the middle of the 1600s, there was. Why? Why was it suddenly necessary to create this thing called the white race? Well, because rich people can count, that's why. And so rich folks looked around, the ones that owned all the land, you know, in the colonies, the colonial elite looked around and they realized something, that they were heavily outnumbered by African enslaved folks, by European indentured servants who were just one level above a slave, or other Europeans who weren't technically indentured servants, but they were still peasants, didn't have any money, didn't have any land, and they could do the math. They added it up and they were like, damn, we got to figure out a way to split these folks apart from one another or they're going to rise up and take our stuff. In that sea of silence where most who are called white would look away, there is yet one amongst us, a white American, who's been standing by blacks in their unending pain, standing out as a voice against the pervasive and oppressive impact on marginalized communities. His name is none other than Tim Wise. Because if you know the history of the whole concept of whiteness, if you know the history of the whole concept of the white race, where it came from and for what reason, you know that it was a trick and it's worked brilliantly. See, prior to the mid to late 1600s in the colonies of what would become the United States, there was no such thing as the white race. Those of us of European descent did not refer to ourselves by that term really ever before then. In fact, in the old countries of Europe, we had spent most of our time killing each other. We didn't love each other. We weren't one big happy family. The side of my family that comes from Scotland, hell, they didn't even worry about fighting people outside of Scotland. Highlanders and lowlanders just fought the hell out of each other. So there was no white race, but in the colonies of what would become the United States, what did we see in the 1660s, 1670s? We began to see that Africans of indentured servant status, many of them not enslaved yet, they were not necessarily permanently enslaved, some were, others were indentured like many poor Europeans for periods of 7 to 11 years. They could work off their indenture and then they would be free labor technically. Realized, as did the white indentured servants, the Europeans who hadn't even been called white yet, that they had a lot of things in common, like the fact that they were all getting their clock cleaned by the elite. And so they would get together more than our history books taught us to foment rebellion against the elite, to try to get a better deal for themselves on the basis of economic necessity and economic justice. And what did the elite do? When you see that you're outnumbered by black and white folks who are penniless, landless, peasants, you have to do one of two things. You either have to kill them all, but you can't do that because who's gonna work? Rich folks weren't going to. They had to get poor people to work. The whole point was to be a person of leisure back in those days. That was the goal, was not to work. So you couldn't kill them all. You didn't want to kill them all. You had to do the work yourself. You had to build your own levy, build your own house. No, pick your own tobacco, harvest your own cotton. No, we're not going to do any of that. So you can't kill them, but you can co-opt them. And so the elite in Virginia, for example, in the colony, begins to give certain carrots 
to people of European descent saying things like, you know, we're going to let you own a little land. Not much, but just a little. And we're going to get rid of indentured servitude. Now you're free labor. And by the way, once you're free labor, you get 50 acres of land just because you're free labor, see? So we're going to cut you in on this deal. We're going to let you enter into contracts. We're going to let you testify in court. And here's the best of all, we're going to put you on the slave patrol to keep those people in line, right? The idea was you're still going to get your clock clean. We still don't like you. We still aren't going to really empower you or change your economic subordination, but we're going to make you honorary members of this team and you're going to help us keep those other people down. Tim Wise from Nashville, Tennessee is not like the everyday white American. He never did feel less concerned, nor did look away from the sufferings of black Americans. Bravely, this respectable individual has devoted so much effort in exposing just how the American system was designed to work against black Americans. So they got a little taste of power and it did effectively divide and conquer those coalitions. Those rebellions began to stop almost instantly. Fast forward to the Civil War era, you have rich white folks in the South where I come from standing up and openly admitting that the reason they're prepared to secede from the Union and the only reason they ever articulated publicly, ever, was to maintain and extend slavery and white supremacy not only where it already existed but into the newly acquired, that is to say, stolen territories from Mexico to the West. That was what they said. Now we lie about it. We say it wasn't about slavery. That it was about states' rights. Yes, the right of the states to keep and maintain slaves. Exactly. But back then they had no shame, so they didn't try and cover it up. They openly said it, but once again, the rich didn't want to go do the work. Are you kidding? <laughs> no. They're going to get poor people to go fight for them. And the poor folks didn't even own slaves. Now think, how do you get poor people who don't even own the shirt on their back, let alone slaves, to go fight to keep your slaves for you? You've got to convince them that their skin is more important than their economic interest. Because think about it, if I am a farmer who has to charge you a dollar a day or two dollars a week to work on your farm and harvest that tobacco or pick that cotton, but you can get a black person to do it for free because you own them, who's going to get the job? Not me. In other words, slavery actually undermined the wages and the wage base, the economic floor of the typical white working class or low income person. But they were told, if these people are freed, they're going to take your job. No fool, they got your job. That's the point. And so at some level, again, working class white people being harmed by white privilege, relatively being advantaged, right? Being given a leg up, being given a membership to the club, but in absolute terms being kept economically subordinated by the very thing that gave them a sense of superiority. How's that for irony? Then in the present era, this hasn't stopped. This is not ancient history. Now we have people running around insisting that we should close the border with Mexico because if we don't, the wages of working class people will continue to fall. The implication being that the only reason workers are paid like crap in this country is because the border is open. But if you believe that, you would actually have to believe that if that border were closed, that all these owners of capital and industry would just say, oh well, you figured us out. Here, it's a raise. Do we really believe that the only thing keeping bosses from paying people more is the presence of low-wage, medium, semi-skilled labor from south of this artificial border? Is that really what we believe we know? That if that border is closed, it isn't going to be closed to capital. It isn't going to be closed to goods. If you have a border that can be crossed by capital looking for the highest return on investment or goods looking for the highest price, but labor is chained to its country of origin, how is that going to work to the benefit of working people? By definition, it doesn't. By definition, it immiserates the working class. Divide and conquer. By breaking ranks, Mr. Wise inspired others to re-examine their own biases against black people and set their paths straight. His unconventional perspective shed light on hidden truths. But the best example of all, perhaps, in the contemporary era, in the greater New Orleans area after Katrina, here you have two communities that were the most hard hit. The Lower Ninth Ward, mostly black community, 94% African American, about 40% official poverty rate, heavy working class community. And right across the canal, St. Bernard Parish, Chalmette, 95% white, also working class, high levels of poverty, economically very similar. And at the end of the day, in those first few days of September 2005, more similar than they probably would have realized. Because when those levees broke, they all got their stuff jacked. 
They all got their stuff destroyed. But if you had asked white folks in Chalmette, and I've done it, who was the cause of the problems in the greater New Orleans area prior to that flooding, they would have pointed across that canal at those black folks, wouldn't have called them black folks, and would have said there. That's the problem. 70% of the white folks in St. Bernard Parish voted for David Duke white supremacist, neo-Nazi, former head of the largest Ku Klux Klan group in the United States when he ran for governor in 1991. Seven out of ten gladly voted for him because he was blaming black folks for all of their problems and they bought it. What's the irony? The irony is that while they were blaming black people for their problems, while they were blaming black people for the conditions of the greater New Orleans area in which they lived, nobody was paying attention, least of all they, to the fact that these white elite politicians, either in Baton Rouge or in Washington, whose job it was to secure those levies, to make sure that levy funds were spent in the proper way and that they were spent at all, those mostly white and mostly elite politicians did nothing. At the end of the day, it wasn't just the black folks in the lower ninth ward they didn't care about. They really couldn't have given a rat's ass about those poor and working class white folks either. And yet, when the people of Chalmette, people of St. Bernard Parish got back into session, first time they had a city council meeting, parish council meeting after the flooding, the lights aren't even on yet. The water isn't even hooked up. And the first order of business was to pass an ordinance saying that you couldn't rent property in St. Bernard Parish to anyone who wasn't a blood relative. Now I'll leave it to your imagination as to why you'd want to pass a law. That law had never existed before. But now that it's been emptied out and you don't know who might come back, that's a damn good way to keep black people out, isn't it? Because if you're 95% white to begin with, if you pass an ordinance that says that, that's a great, you can't say no blacks need apply. You can't say no blacks allow, but that was an ingenious way to get around the law. Now they got caught. There was a lawsuit threatened and they got rid of the ordinance. But my point in bringing it up is to say, once again, divide and conquer is working. These white folks in Chalmette need to march across that canal and join hands with the black folks who've been sitting there more than willing to work with them for an awful long time and march on Baton Rouge and march on DC and march on the Corps of Engineers and recognize their commonality of interest. But the whiteness and the lure of whiteness has tricked these have nothing in their bank account white people into believing that they got more in common with the rich white folks on St. Charles Avenue that didn't lose anything in that flooding than they have in common with the black working class folks who live about 500 yards away. Supporting Tim Wise's claims, several studies show that racial disparities in income, wealth, education, imprisonment, and health outcomes persist to this day. The beliefs and narratives that black Americans have about institutional harm have long been studied by scholars in the health and social sciences and the humanities. Narratives about how institutions were designed to hold black people back also surfaced in several of the online focus groups Pew Research Center conducted with this study just last year. To measure the prevalence of these narratives of mistrust, they would conduct a survey of 4,736 black adults in the U.S. from September 12th to September 24th, 2023. First respondents were asked if they had ever heard a series of statements about how U.S. institutions might intentionally or negligently harm black people. Respondents were then asked if they thought these harms were also happening to black people today. Here are some key findings about black Americans' beliefs in institutional mistrust. 76% of black adults say black public officials today are singled out to be discredited in a way that doesn't happen to white public officials. 76% say police today do very little to stop guns and drugs from flooding black communities. 74% say black people are more likely than white people to be incarcerated because prisons want to make money on the backs of black people today. 67% of black Americans say businesses today target marketing of luxury products to black people in order to put them into debt. 55% of black adults say secret and non-consensual medical experiments, like the Tuskegee study, are happening to black people today. 55% of black adults say the government today encourages single motherhood and the elimination of black men from black families. 51% of black adults say the government promotes birth control and abortion to reduce the size of the black population, and this is happening today. The report also finds that black Americans who have experienced racial discrimination are more likely to believe U.S. institutions intentionally or negligently harm black people. There are also modest differences among black Americans by gender, education, family income, and political affiliation. 
Still, majorities across many black demographic subgroups are familiar with these statements about the intentions of many U.S. institutions and say these things are happening to black people today. However, Tim Wise would not hesitate to stand up front, opening the eyes of his white contemporaries to the truth of the daily perpetual policies of inequality and black exclusive stereotypes, which white contemporaries would normally look away from. This was him in The Rock Newman Show nine years ago. The reason white folks get defensive about the conversation is if you say we're going to talk about racism, white Americans think you're getting ready to call them racist. And that's not what we're not talking about individual races. I, for one, don't care if Darren Wilson is a racist. What I care about is a culture of policing that engenders the abuse of black and brown people, even among cops who are not bigots. Like he could be a Boy Scout. He could be a great guy. He, you know, they had this conversation with George Zimmerman killed Trayvon. And I realized George Zimmerman, technically a Latino, but pretty white identified in terms of his character and who he hangs out with and all that. Here's a guy. They said, well, he's not a racist. He dated a black girl, took her to prom, mentored black children. It doesn't matter because he is internalizing the same messages from the media, from the schools that we all are. So we don't have to feel what are those guilty. Messages? Those messages are that black men are dangerous because if you look at the news, there have been studies on this, local news overrepresents black folks as perpetrators, overrepresents white folks as victims. So the message that gets sent is they're dangerous and specifically to you. They are not only bad people, they're going to hurt you. So therefore, we want to keep them on that side of town. We want to keep their children in those schools over there. We don't want to work around them, we don't want to live around them, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that message comes through loud and clear in the way that media uh, represents people of color. You know, whenever we, uh, thinking about uh, Tamir Rice, the 12 year old child that was shot in Cleveland by police, when that happened, what did they do? The first news story in Cleveland that made a big splash was about Tamir Rice's parents and the history of domestic abuse and criminality among his parents, not about the cop that killed him. We talk worse about black victims than we do white killers. What did we say about Ted Bundy? Oh, he was so smart and he was so quiet and he always seemed so nice. Every time one of these white boys goes and shoots up a school, what did we say? We had no idea he was gonna do this. So we talk better, we have more sympathy for white folks who commit mass murder, bury bodies under the house, cook them up in a soup pot and eat them, right, than we do black folks folks who were killed by police, we start digging for every bad thing they ever did. We want to know if they had a juvenile record. We want to know if they'd ever been arrested. That's what the media does. And until that changes, I'm afraid white folks will stay in denial and it'll be very hard for us to move forward, whether we're talking about cops or just average everyday folks. And after Wise was through talking, the host would then go on to say, We have a very diver diverse viewing audience. White folks comprise some of that viewing audience. Some of them might be sitting out there right now thinking that you don't like white folks. <laughs> Described as one of America's great public moralists and amongst the 25 visionaries who are changing the world, Tim Wise was among the most prominent anti-racist writers and educators in the United States. He has spent the past 25 years speaking to audiences in all 50 states in the U.S. So far, this colorblind response, this post-racial response that says, oh, let's not, let's not name that elephant. Let's not call out what it is we're seeing. Let's redefine it, right, is an extraordinarily dangerous gamble. And we see it at every turn. So when former President Carter made the point that some of that overt resentment was about race, you know, the president and all of his advisors rushed to dismiss that even as obvious as it was that Carter was speaking the truth. They all said, oh, I'm sure that's not it. I'm sure they're just anxious about the economy. That's not credible. And for a president to say that and for his handlers to say that, I I'm anxious about the economy. Everyone in here is probably anxious about the economy, but I've never, as a result of my economic anxiety, felt the need to go get a sign with a picture of a president dressed in an African witch doctor costume with a bone through his nose and go to a rally as a way to try to find a job. Like, I'm really, I'm unemployed and I'm upset and this is all I could think of. <laughs> what? Right? It's not about that. It's about something else. And the fact that the president has to second guess the abuse, the most powerful man in the world, arguably, but he can't even name what is obvious. He can't even call it out for what it is. You can't criticize an act of racial profiling by the Cambridge Police Department without being attacked. You know when Henry Louis Gates got stopped by that officer for trying to break into his own house and the officer wanted to know, do you live here? He lived there for eight years, but the neighbor who first saw him and thought he was breaking in didn't recognize him. This man is 57 years old, walks with a cane. He is not the typical profile of a burglar. Right? 
But the cop comes in, challenges Henry Louis Gates. Gates gets angry at the cop, as you would too if someone accused you of breaking into your own house. So he gets a little mouthy with the cop. You know, the cop doesn't like that. Arrest him for disorderly conduct. Now, here's the trick. In the state of Massachusetts, talking back to a cop, even yelling at a cop, is not, in fact, disorderly conduct. Not a smart idea. I don't recommend it. But it is not illegal. So when they arrested the man for a crime that he didn't commit, they made a horrible and egregious error, which was corrected when the charges were dropped. But the next day when they asked the president about it and he said, if you recall, I think the Cambridge police acted stupidly, all hell broke loose and people started attacking him all over the country. And Rush Limbaugh said, this is a black president trying to destroy a white police officer. Once again, pushing buttons of racial resentment, pushing buttons of racial resentment, when in fact, what the president said, even if you don't think it's very presidential, to say stupid, you know, maybe that's a little juvenile, you know, a little beneath the dignity of the president, you know, but it was accurate because what do you call a cop that arrests you for a crime you didn't commit? Well, stupid. Before you get the badge, Mr. Lawman, and before you get the gun, you might want to read the law and familiarize yourself with the law that you're sworn to uphold. But the president said it, and then he learned from that, what? That I can't talk about race. Even though I'm the president of the United States, if you want to know just how not post-racial we are, that's all you need to know. Because if we were post-racial, he could say anything he wanted. Nobody could do anything to him. But we aren't, and so we can't. And so we keep dodging it. Now, it's one thing for him to dodge it. It's quite another for us to do it. You know, he's got to play whatever game he feels he needs to play, I suppose. But that doesn't mean we have to play that game. And the fact that we're getting sucked into that post-racial logic, too, we're saying things like, well, we just can't, we can't talk about this. We have, to, we have to maintain the optimism that people felt after the election. And if you talk about racism, you know, it'll, it'll, it'll throw a wet blanket on that. You know, all these kids who were all invigorated, particularly kids of color and parents of color that were, and understandably, look, I get that. I understand that. I don't have to be a person of color to know that that was real. But the danger in therefore deciding we're not going to talk about this systemic injustice anymore because we got to protect him. Wise has appeared on more than 1,500 college and high school campuses, also at hundreds of professional and academic conferences and before community groups nationwide in his war against racism. He is, in fact, a prophetic voice in this generation on a mission to reform the white mindset and stereotypes on blacks worldwide. Critical race theory was created in the late 70s and early 1980s, and no one said anything about it, right? No one really cared outside of like, you know, sort of picayune debates in law schools, which is where critical race theory is principally applied. So why would all of a sudden it become necessary to attack critical race theory? Because the timing coincides with this uprising and the idea is to shut down any conversation about racial injustice in America. Because you don't want those white folks to become allies. You don't want those white folks to act in solidarity. You don't want them to learn the truth about the history of the country. And you say it's because you're trying to protect their feelings. That's what they say, right? We don't want white folks to feel bad about being white. Nobody's trying to make anybody feel bad about being white. But if that is your concern, there's a really easy solution. Teach about some different white people. Right? If you're feeling guilty about white folks, and maybe you just need to focus a little less on Andrew Jackson and a little bit more on people like Jeremiah Everts, who was a white man who's one of his principal opponents to indigenous removal. Because there were white folks who stood up against that mess. There were white folks who joined the abolitionist struggle, whose names we don't know. Lydia Marie Child, the Grimke sisters, John Fee, an abolitionist preacher who was defrocked from his church by the Presbyterian Synod because he refused to minister to slaveholders, founded Berea College in Kentucky, right? Why don't we know these people's names? Why don't we teach these white anti-racist allies who acted in solidarity with black peoples, right? Because if you're concerned that anti-racists like me are trying to make white people feel bad about being white, and I'm telling you, no, there are these other role models that we could have, why don't you want to teach about them? That would be the solution to white guilt, right? You don't have to feel guilt and shame when you know you got a choice to make. And here are these examples of people who made that choice. Joan Trump, Howard Mulholland in the civil rights struggle, Bob and Dottie Zellner, Connie Curry, Virginia Foster Durr. Like I could go down this list, all these names of people who have fought. Some of them died for the cause of racial equity. There haven't been enough of us. 
I mean, there have been enough who've died, don't get me wrong, I didn't mean it that way. But there haven't been enough of us who joined in solidarity, but we've always been there. Why don't we learn about those folks in school, see? The people that attack critical race theory don't talk about doing that. They don't want that taught. They just don't want race talked about at all. They don't want us to deal with what's real. So it's never too young to start talking about these things. We have so many folks in this country, though, that are afraid. They don't know how to do it well, so they'd rather just not do it at all. And for most white Americans, we simply don't want to acknowledge the reality that black and brown peoples have known for very long in this country, which is that systemic racism is fundamental and foundational to the country. And if you say that in a public school in the state of Tennessee this fall, right, you're going to risk getting fired, I guess. If you say it in Florida, they're going to be able to sue you. I was just in Indiana, same thing, right? If you say what I just said, the systemic racism was fundamental and foundational to this country from its inception, which by the way is not an opinion. It's not an opinion. It's not a debatable, rebuttable presumption. It's a fact, and I'm going to prove it to you. It doesn't take a lot of time. Systemic racism is fundamental and foundational to the American system. That was Tim Wise at it again, telling it like it is. In this event, he had gone on to throw great light on how white dominance and citizenship denial to people of color was a most important factor in the project called the United States, where the Naturalization Act, enacted by the very first Congress of the American government, is a foundational example of systemic racism. So racism was foundational to this country. Don't, touch, don't take my word for it. Take the words and the actions of those who were the founders and the initiators of the project known as the United States. Talk about what the very first Congress in this country did after the ratification of the Constitution, right? What's the first thing that Congress did after the Constitution was ratified in terms of legislation? Because you got to assume whatever they did first is their way of saying this is the most important thing, right? Like that makes sense. You don't, you don't do the most important thing like seventh. You do it first, right? So you might think to yourself, well, gosh, I don't know, Tim, maybe the first thing they did was make sure that they had a sufficient army in case the Brits decided to come back and have another run at it. No, that's not, that's not what they did. Or you might say, well, maybe they needed to figure out the tax structure so they could figure out how to finance the government. So maybe they did that first. No, no, no. They did that, but they didn't do that first. Right. The very first substantive piece of legislation that Congress passed after the Constitution was ratified was a thing called the Naturalization Act of 1790. It's not something we learn about in history class, very, most, very many of us in high school, I certainly didn't. And I was in AP history, which they say is the history for the smart kids, right? But they apparently didn't think we were smart enough to handle this truth, even in the 1980s, let alone now with all this backlash happening. What did the Naturalization Act of 1790 say? The first thing that Congress decided to take care of, what did it say? It said that all free white persons and only free white persons could be citizens of the United States. In other words, the most important order of business in the mind of the founders and the first Congress was to make sure that everybody understood before we dealt with the army, before we dealt with taxes, before we dealt with tariffs, before we dealt with any of the economic stuff, just make sure y'all know that this new thing here is for us and only us. And nobody who is not white will be considered a citizen of the United States. That tells me that white supremacy is there at the birth, right? It, of course, was there before that, really going back to the colonial period. But I'm just saying, in the actual history of the country's laws, it's there from the beginning. Again, not an opinion. There is no rebuttal to what I just said. It happened, and it reads exactly as I say it reads with the intention that I suggest it had. So then the question is, do we understand what the legacy of that kind of germ of white supremacy is do we just assume that that doesn't matter that it doesn't bear fruit right do we assume that the policies that flowed from that assumption about who could be a citizen and who couldn't that those policies would create damage perhaps in their own time but not in ours as if somehow you just flick a switch you pass a law and all of the inertia of the past several generations goes away with unflinching honesty, Wise did uncover the deeply buried secrets of America's past, revealing the enduring legacy of racial injustice that had been deliberately obscured. See, here's the thing. If I were to ask people whether it was this room or any other room in America, do you believe that systemic racism and 
white privilege or advantage are real in 2023, we get a lot of people who would say yes and a lot of people who would say no. And if we're being adults about it, we could have a good conversation, not a debate, but a discussion about it, hopefully. Right? Um, but here's the thing I also know. If I were to ask most anyone in this room or any other room, do you think we had systemic racism and white advantage or privilege in, let's say, 1963 or 1962 before the civil rights laws were on the books? My guess is just about everybody would agree that that would be true, right? Even people that whose politics were very different than mine, even people who denied the problem today in 2023, would probably go along with the idea that 60 years ago it was real, right? Because it doesn't really take a lot of courage to admit that, right? I mean, it just takes like a Google machine. That's all it takes, right? You just, you just need a Google machine and you need to know how to use the Google machine and you could probably find your evidence for that, right? But here's the problem. In 1963, when white Americans were asked that question, about themselves and their country at that time. You see, it's different to ask you about 1963 and 2023. But when white folks were asked that question in 1963, when it was happening, when it was the present, not 60 years in the rear view mirror, and they were asked it by the Gallup organization in that year. The question was, do you believe black folks are treated equally in your community in education, housing, and employment? Now, come on, y'all, it's 1963. We know the answer. This is before the Civil Rights Act, before the Voting Rights Act, before the Fair Housing Act. It is the year of the March on Washington, the year that Medgar Evers is shot down dead in his driveway in Jackson, Mississippi, the year that Governor Wallace stands in the schoolhouse door at the University of Alabama and says, segregation today, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. It is the year that he turns those dogs and water cannons in Birmingham on those children at the behest of Bull Connor. So we know the answer to the question. This is not a hard pop quiz. The answer is no, but what do you think white Americans in 1963 said? Two out of three answered the question, yes, everything here is fine. There is nothing to see. And in 1962, Gallup asked white folks a slightly different question, but only a year earlier. The question was, do you think black children have the same chance to get a good education in your community as white children? Once again, y'all, easy question, even easier answer. It is only eight years after the Brown v. Board decision, but we know it is well before any schools actually moved to create equity, whether with all deliberate speed as the court suggested or not. And yet in 1962, when white folks were asked that question about educational equity, do you think it's real? <laughs> 85 out of 100 white folks said, yes, everything is fine, nothing to see here. Now, come on. There are only two possible explanations for why the vast majority of white folks couldn't see the truth. Explanation number one is that white folks are just so, 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 so stupid and ignorant and cold hearted that they just can't see or just refuse to see. I don't happen to believe that's true. Were there people like that then? Are there people like that now? Well, of course, there are people like that in every generation, every racial or ethnic group, cultural group, every part of the country, of course. But I don't believe for a second that explains 85 out of 100 or 65 out of 100, whatever the 1963 question was. Right? I think there's an easier and a more disturbing answer to the question, and it's about privilege. The reason white folks didn't know is because they didn't have to know. Right? If you were white in 1963, did you actually have to know black folks lived reality? Even though it's being beamed to you every night on the TV, every night. There were only three stations, y'all. It's not like you could ignore it, right? We didn't have all these stations, y'all know that. We had three stations, they went off at midnight with the Pledge of Allegiance or the National Anthem and then it just was like gray matter for like six hours until it came back on. So the idea that you could have somehow missed what was happening in Birmingham, missed what was happening in Mississippi, missed what was happening during the March on Washington, 200,000 people on the mall down the road, right? How could you miss it? It's not like you, oh, I'm sorry, I was watching Netflix. No, you weren't. You were watching Walter Cronkite because it's all there was. He relentlessly urged the white nation in general to quit racial injustice and stand up for what's right and just. Even when people are generally very progressive in the way that they think about a number of social issues. When we talk about race, and we talk about racism, we almost always focus on the other, right? Those who were different from the dominant norm, whatever the dominant norm may be. So we put the spotlight on them and therefore the pressure. We put the attention on them and therefore the pressure. We may ask, for instance, what's wrong with them? And how can we fix them? 
How can we bring them, whoever they may be, into the mainstream of the economy? How can we bring them into the mainstream of the economic and educational systems? How can we make their lives better? And what do we need to know about them so as to help them improve their lives? But the underlying assumption of all of those statements and all of those things, even if they are well-intended and sound nice, the underlying assumption of all of them is that the deficit is to be found in the marginalized population, that they are the ones with the deficit, that they are the ones who need to be fixed. But what if the deficit is in the dominant culture and we're just not paying attention to that? What if the conditions of life experienced by marginalized populations, whether First Nations peoples here in Canada, whether indigenous and First Nations peoples in the United States, or African Americans or Latinos in the United States, whoever it is, there's a big difference between guilt and responsibility after all. Guilt is something you feel for what you've done and responsibility is something you take because of the kind of person that you are. They're not strictly speaking synonyms. And so when we inherit the legacy, not of 36 and a half hour old gumbo, but the legacy of institutionalized racial and ethnic discrimination, oppression, privilege, and subordination. When we inherit the legacy of, of sexism and patriarchal oppression, the legacy of economic injustice, the legacy of straight supremacy, all the different forms of supremacy and oppression and suppression that exist within our cultures all across the globe, when we inherit those, and on this continent, we inherit that legacy of white supremacy. Let us be clear. Let us name it and call it what it is. We inherit a legacy of white supremacy. We have to be responsible for how we find it. Not because we are to blame for having created it, but because we're the only ones left to do it, you see. We have to take responsibility for things as we find them, even if we don't create them. At least in theory, that's what we do with ecological destruction and environmental damage. You and I did not individually, I assume, go and belch toxic waste into the air, inject it into the soil, dump it into the waters on this planet, but somebody did, and we're now living with it. So we either clean it or we can sit around and say, well, I didn't do it, you know, I'm innocent. It really wasn't me. You can't blame me. But that doesn't really take care of the problem. If you ever become the CEO of a corporation, I don't know why you'd want to, but if you do, if you do, you won't be able to come in on the first day of work and say to your board of directors, you know, I can't wait to make use of all the assets you people uh, were able to get before I came on board, all the assets you were able to develop, all the revenue you were able to generate. I can't wait to take advantage of that. But as for all those outstanding debts that you ran up, like your bills and the loans that you took out so that you could grow the company, no, I don't have any intention of paying those. That was the last CEO. You really should have gotten him or her to do that. You know, I'm new. I'm innocent. I just got here, you see. The difference between guilt and responsibility. Tim Wise's courageous call to action challenges the white nation to abandon racial injustice and champion equality. His words would always be an inspiration to collective awakening, mobilizing the nation toward a future where every individual has equal opportunities to thrive. Thank you for staying with us till the end of another engaging video. Kindly consider subscribing if you're yet to. Also, don't forget to like, comment, and share as your support goes a long way in motivating us. Thank you for watching, and see you in the next video.